today. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everybody. So I'm Vasilios Marulas, and I'm uh, from actually down the street here in Mathematics and Business Analytics and Statistics Department at the University of Tennessee. Um, so today, the role that I'm going to play here in this uh, uh, workshop, uh, beautifully organized by Dan and Ronald, um, is I'd like to, to bring to, to your attention uh, topics of statistical inference. Uh, and I understand that uh, there was all this big topic uh, with respect to this journal in psychology, I believe, where everything started, that they said they are going to reject papers uh, if you report on p-value, all right? Uh, because there is some supposedly bad research there. That is not true, as we will see in, uh, in, uh, in this talk and uh, Dr. Wasserstein's uh, right after mine. Um, so today, I will start with the test of significance for the mean population. So I'm going to motivate everybody with the mean population, all right? Uh, and then, as we progress in this talk, we will be, to uh, we'll be talking about caveats in considering uh, this test of significance, things that we need to pay attention to, all right? And we, we should not take anything, everything for free, okay? And then we will see other tests of significance. I will just touch on them. And then at the end, about a third of this talk is going to be some alternatives because you may not really need to do a p-value, okay? And then I will leave you alone and then I will conclude, <laughs> okay? So anyway, so a test of significance is basically a formal procedure for comparing observed data with a hypothesis whose truth we want to assess, okay? So the hypothesis is a statement about the parameters in a population or model, okay? And the results of a test are expressed in terms of a probability that measures how well the data and the hypothesis agree, okay? So, this slide, it will be the denser out of all of them, uh, but let's, let's throw all the terminology so we can be done with that. So first of all is the null hypothesis, as you, everybody knows here, we, which we will denote within this talk by H naught, okay? And the test of significance is basically designed so that you assess the strength of evidence against the null hypothesis, all right? And the null hypothesis is usually a statement of no effect or no difference, okay? So basically the default assumption is that nothing happened or nothing changed. Then of course you have the competitive, competing argument, which is the alternative hypothesis. And in this talk I will denote it by H1, or sometimes you will see it H of A. Sometimes I'm, I may be inconsistent. Uh, but this is the notation across all books. The, what is important here is to, under, to, to decide if your alternative hypothesis is going to be one-sided or, or two-sided, and then we'll see why that's important. Once you have a perfect statement, null versus alternative, then what you need to do is you need to evaluate, the, you need to, to find the test statistic. And basically, the test statistics measure the compatibility between the null hypothesis and uh, the data themselves, okay? And basically it is employed for calculating the probability needed for our test of significance. This probability is basically the p-value, okay? So the p-value now, if you assume that the null hypothesis is true, then it is the probability that the test statistic would take a value as extreme or even more extreme than what was actually observed. Okay, and the smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence against the null hypothesis. And this is a formal definition of the p-value. And people, uh, practitioners, should take it for what it is. Of course, I understand that when you want to report on a, when you want to report and assess if, if uh, about your study, then you need to have a level, okay, a decisive level to make a decision, okay? And this is the, the alpha level of significance that you compare your p-value to, okay? And then you say if p-value is smaller, uh, uh, less or equal than alpha than the level of significance, then we say that the data is statistically significant at level alpha, and then you go ahead and you reject your null hypothesis. Okay, 
So, so this is the notation, okay? So let's, let's look at an example. So um, I should apologize to this audience. I'm not, I've never worked with agricultural data, but so maybe these examples may be a little bit toy problems for you, but anyway, just to motivate uh, 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 the, the, the main theme of this, of this talk. Okay, so, so basically, Temperature, I understand, plays an important role, and then there are two ways to measure temperature, perhaps with uh, 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 ground sensors and air-based measurements, okay? So with the ground sensors are quite expensive, and uh, that's what I read on, uh, in uh, Wikipedia, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and the air-based of infrared wavelengths may be biased, okay? So you go ahead, you get these 10 data, which I found online, Okay, and then you have the ground measurements here on 10 uh, locations and in uh, the associated locations, 10, uh, in these 10 associated locations, uh, the air-based measurements, and you take the difference. And basically your goal is to measure if there is, to test if, if, this, if, if they are different. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna take, oops, I'm going to take all these, all these things now and I'm going to, to project on this example. Okay, so, so first of all, we need to start with the null versus the alternative hypothesis. Ah, one, one point which is very important is, I'm going to assume that the data that I have here have been perfectly, sorry, the experiment that led me to this example, to this data, has been perfectly designed. And this is a very important uh, uh, topic, okay? So you need to do, we need to do the homework before we design an experiment so that the data is informative. Otherwise, garbage in, garbage out. All right, so let's assume that. So now, the hypothesis now always refer to some population, as I said earlier, or a model, okay? Not to a particular outcome, okay? So for this, we state the null hypothesis and the alternative in terms of population parameters. Since now I would like to test, to test the mean difference here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider as mu the population's difference between ground and air temperatures, okay? And this is my statement. The null hypothesis, mu is equal to zero, no effect, nothing changed, versus the alternative hypothesis that mu is not equal to zero something changed, there was an effect, okay? So now, if there is a reason to believe before any data collection, okay, that the parameter being tested is necessarily restricted to one par particular side of null hypothesis, then this is what we say H1, the alternative hypothesis, should be one-sided, okay? So, and what I mean by this, you may have a left tail test where mu, the alternative hypothesis, is less than zero, or right tail test where the null hypothesis is greater than zero, okay? But again, this should be pre-factum, not post-factum, not after you collect the data. Okay, so now since like the statement is out of the way, okay, we know what we are testing, okay? We need to compute the test statistic. Now the test is based on, uh, and this test statistic is basically estimates is going to be based on an estimate of the parameter that appears in the hypothesis. What do I mean by this is, maybe I should, maybe let me, let me speak generally first. So if the null hypothesis now is true, then we expect the estimate to take a value close, quote, quote, to the parameter value specified by the null hypothesis, okay? So, so the values of the estimate far from the parameter value in null hypothesis yield evidence against the null hypothesis. So in a general formulation, the test statistic should look like this. It is the estimate, okay, minus the hypothesized value, which is under the null hypothesis, over the standard deviation of the estimate. And this is the only formula that you need to know, okay? Now, this is something very important. The test statistic is a random variable, it's not a number, okay? And what do I mean by a random variable? It means it follows some sort of distribution that we know, okay? 
So, okay, so if, if this was a little bit too confusing, let's go and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and discuss uh, about this example, okay? So the estimate now, so the hypothesized value, it is mu equals to zero. So since we're talking about population parameter, uh, mean uh, population, the estimate of the mean is going to be the sample mean, okay? So you're going to find the average, basically, of the data that you collected. Okay, so, so as I said here, the estimate is the average of differences provided by the data and a realization for this tailor to this data, if you do your math correctly, and I use a calculator just to make sure, it is negative 1.55, okay? So then there is this, this little uh, denominator here, okay, which says the standard deviation of estimate. So for now, I'm going to assume that, which, something which is typically not true, that the standard deviation of population is equal to two. Why two? I just chose this number for the sake of this talk, okay? We, I will change this assumption in uh, my later slides. So, so if you go and you compute this Z star, which is again a realization of the test statistic tailored to this data, Okay, then I substitute my number minus the hypothesized value, minus zero, which means, over the standard deviation of the estimate, which is 2 over square root of 10. This is the standard deviation of, of the sample mean. You divide by square root of 10. 10 is the sample size, which it was 10, the 10 locations that you collected data from. And then you arrive to this uh, beautiful number, negative 2.4508, okay? I don't know why it's beautiful, but it's beautiful. All numbers are beautiful. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So you computed your statistic. So now let's go to the core of this talk, which is the p-value. So let's compute the p-value for this, for this problem. Okay. Before doing so, let me remind you that the p-value is the sampling distribution, the key to calculating the p-value is the sampling distribution of the test statistic. Because the test statistic is not a number. The test statistic is a random variable which follows a distribution. Okay? This is very important. Now, if I assume that the data is normal, and I have in a parenthesis that this thing needs to be checked, we will see later on how, okay? Then the Z star, for example, the number that I computed here is a realization of capital Z, where the capital Z is the standard normal distribution. Okay? So, and how you compute the p-value, it really depends on your test. So, if my test was, let's say, two-sided, as it's going to be in this, in this example, okay, then the, the p-value is twice this probability. So basically what you say, it is the probability that the standard normal distribution is going to be larger or at least equal to this z star, where z star is the number that you just found. Now, why I have this two is because it is a two-sided, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have one number here and then the negative part of that number because the, 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 the normal distribution is symmetric, okay? Now, if, you, if, you're talking about, if you're talking about the left tail distribution or the right tail distribution, then you see that the inequality here, okay, follows the same pattern as your alternative, all right? Okay, fine. So if you go back to your example, which was this one, okay? This is a two-sided. should point here. This is my Z star. So if I go to this formulation, I'm going to, to substitute for the numbers that I found, and then my p-value is going to be this 0 0.0143. Okay. And then people, practitioners, would go and compare that to some, alpha to some alpha level of significance, okay? This is fine, but again, the p-value, we should take it for what it is. 
And this number actually tells me much more than just a comparison with the alpha value. This number tells me that if the population mean difference were zero, which means if the null hypothesis were true, then a mean difference as large as that observed would occur fewer than 14, 14 times in 1,000 samples of size 10. Okay? I'm pretty convinced by this statement okay, that the mean difference between ground and air-based measured temperatures is not zero. Okay? And this is the important, the important fact here. Of course, so the p-value is more informative than just a reject or not the null hypothesis. Okay? Actually, you get more information if you really analyze it. Okay? So I understand, though, as managers or like as practitioners, so we would like our paper to get uh, uh, accepted and not rejected, of course. Okay? So you would like to show a quick way of assessment. Okay? And this is what we compare it with the alpha level of significance. Okay? So this is basically the borderline that you draw if something is, accepting, is accepted or not, rejected. And then you say, well, if p-value is less or equal than uh, alpha, then you reject the null hypothesis, okay, uh, or you accept the, the alternative hypothesis. And if the p-value is greater than alpha, then you say, uh, you don't say that uh, you accept the null hypothesis, but what it should be stated correctly is that the data do not provide sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. This is the, the correct jargon here. So, so with this retro slide here, what, all I'm trying to, to see is like, let's go back to this example and see everything all together. So I started with this data that I assumed that, they were, that the experiment was correctly designed so that my data is very much informative. And then I tested the null hypothesis mu equals to zero versus the alternative hypothesis mu not equal to zero. Then I computed the test statistic, okay, here I should have had z star under the null, the null hypothesis being true. And then I computed the p-value, and the p-value is this basically shaded area here. Now, what I wanted to do is I want to compare, the, let that, let's say, to this favorite alpha being 0 0.05. This is the popular number for whatever reason, okay? So, and you... Like this alpha, basically, it is a probability. The, which probability? The shaded re red area. Okay? This probability is associated with a number on the distribution, 1.96 on the right-hand side and negative 1.96 on, 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 on the left-hand side, where you would like to compare it with the Z star. See, the Z star here, it was 2.4508, and on, on this side, uh, it's negative counterpart. Okay. So, and then you go ahead, you, you, you say, okay, fine, p-value obviously is smaller than the alpha level, so I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. But I did not have to do that, this comparison with the alpha. Okay? If you recall, the statement, it was that if the null hypothesis uh, uh, was true, then all I'm going, with this data that I collected, this mean difference as large as the observed would occur fewer than 14 times in 1,000 samples, okay? This is pretty small to have. Okay, so, so when I computed this statistic, okay, so in general I had the null hypothesis mu equals to some constant, zero in our example, Okay? And then we computed this statistic, which was the estimate, which is the, 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 the mean, minus the, the hypothesized value, which is C, the constant, in our case was zero, over the standard deviation of the population, sigma, over square root of n. And that was the Z statistic. Okay? That's how we computed the Z star. Okay? We substitute actually the value from the data. Now, as I said in a parenthesis, the variance is typically unknown. You don't know the variance of the entire population, right? And what we and I say to, to my undergrads uh, that in statistics, when we don't know something, we never give up. We estimate it. 
Okay, so, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to estimate it by the sample variance, which what I call here by S. I'm not going to give you the formula. It's totally out of the scope of this talk. But anyway, just to have a formula and compare it with the, the, the statistic, you get a different statistic, which is X minus the constant over now the sample variance divided by square root of N. But now, this statistic here, which is a random variable, does not come from, is not distributed as the standard normal distribution, but it is distributed as the t distribution. Okay? The t distribution behaves very similarly with so many degrees of freedom uh, with, as, as, as the standard normal distribution, but for smaller degrees of freedom, and then I'll, I'll, I'll I'll say in a minute what I mean by that. It's kind of like bell-shaped as a standard normal distribution, but it has kind of heavier tails. What I say to my undergraduates is like, imagine happy feet. OK, so it has happy feet <laughs> dragging along. All right? So, but everything else should follow exactly the very same way. OK? So you, ha you have the same strategy. You compute the p-value. And if you like, you compare it with an alpha level of significance. OK, so let's go back to this example. Remember, we have these 10 locations. Then you have the ground temperatures, the air temperatures, and this is the difference. And again, my test is the very same thing. OK, so what I want to do is I want to compute the mean, the mean difference being equal to zero minus, uh, versus, I'm sorry, uh, the alternative hypothesis mu, mu not equal to zero. And then you're going ahead and you're going to compute the T star now, not the Z star, since it's a Z, T distribution. The mean remains the same. It is one, negative 1.55 minus the hypothesized value over now the sample variance. Okay, so you compute the variance of this data which happened to be 0 0.7706 divided by the square root of the sample size, 10. And then you get this another beautiful number here, which is negative 6.458. Again, I'm going to compute the p-value. The p-value is going to be twice the probability of this t, OK, greater or equal. I should have had here the absolute value of negative 6.458, but you get this is just 6.458, okay? And this is going to be this tiny probability, okay? So what I have by T9 here, it means this T statistic is a realization from the T distribution, and the T distribution has degrees of freedom, okay? What the degrees of, where the degrees, free, degrees of freedom coming from is from the fact that you estimate one random variable in it. OK, which is the sample size here. So the t distribution is going to be n minus 1 okay, degrees of freedom. n is the sample size, 10 minus 1, 9. That's where these degrees of freedom come. But again, what this number tells me is that a mean difference as large as that observed would occur fewer than 2 times in 10,000 samples of size 10 if the population mean difference were zero, OK? And again, you may want to, comp but you could st stop just there, and then you could just compare it with the, p with the alpha level of significance, where here it doesn't even make any sense to take 0.05. It's so tiny, OK? Anything, it will be uh, smaller. So you just reject uh, the null hypothesis. All right. So fine. Um, the thing is, what do I know about these t-tests? Are they robust? Okay, so are they going to give me a, a, a good answer? Do I know anything about it? The answer is yes, I do. I can search for things. I can understand how these t-tests behave. So the t-tests are not robust against outliers. And the reason for that is because they are based on the mean and the sample, vari the sample mean and the sample variance, where both of them are not resistant to outliers. What I mean by this is, uh, and please correct me, this is another statement I read at uh, Wikipedia. Uh, and 
at R1 stage of their growth, I have no clue what R1 stage is, but it sounds cool, so it makes me look very professional. Maybe not. <laughs> so the average height of soybean plants is about 16 inches. Okay? So imagine now if you have three plants with height 16 inches, exactly on the average, and then you get three, another three plants with 20 inches. Now their average has been pushed from kind of 16 all the way up to 18. Okay, so we maybe start believing that something else is going on. Maybe that the average height of soybeans is not 16 anymore. Okay, since we live in this umbrella of small sample size. Okay, now the T test, uh, um, on the other hand, the T tests are robust against <coughs> deviations from normality. We will see in a minute, not, this is not really 100% true. Okay, but not to outliers and presence of strong skewness. So outliers I just touched in my first bullet. What I mean by skewness, imagine that this is like what we call in statistics the QQ plot, the, the normal probability plot actually. What this does, you don't need to know anything else, but if you plot the QQ plot, okay, if all these blue points, which is the real data, lie perfectly along this red line, then not perfectly, but with some certain deviations, you could just say that my distribution, the date of the distribution is coming from a normal, a standard normal distribution, from a normal distribution, okay? Which is a good thing. Here that does not happen, okay? You see there is like this curve. And actually when the, this curve exists, we say that the data is right skewed. If it was the other way, then you could say that it's left skewed, okay? So the t-test is not robust when skewness exists, okay? So some advice is the following. If you have a small sample size, you could use the t-test if the data are close to normal, but if outliers are present, do not use the t-test, okay? Then if you come down to a moderate sample size, what is a moderate sample size? I leave that up to you to decide. 16, 17, 20, 30, something of that sort. Okay? Then you could use the t-test except in the presence of strong skewness or outliers. And then if you have a large sample size, you can use the t-test even for clearly skewed distributions. Why? Because when you have a large sample test, then the T distribution behaves very much similar as the normal distribution. So the normal distribution says there, there is no outlier. Everything looks normal. That's what normal is. Yes. I have a question here. Sure. If right now you have a, you know, uh, the T test that you use properly or not properly, I mean, you have a, depending on the sample size, <laughs> some size and also a lot of the parameter here you have is outliers mm -hmm. so you talk about the sum size you can you can define so then now for outliers do you have any estimate since, since you are statisticians and as you said if you don't have a number you will estimate if you don't estimate your random number okay as I as I will so what's show the, what's the so sorry for each sum each type of uh, population and uh, do we have like a percentage of the outlier uh, can be, uh, you know, for example, like small sample size, you have a two, you have a ten, but you already have a, have a two outliers, or you have a one outlier, or you have a four outliers, so it's a different story. Sure, I mean, if you have ten data and five out of the ten you consider them outlier, maybe you did not design your experiment right. No, but the, okay, but, the but if you have one outlier out of the ten points, then something else might be going on. So then, 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 then therefore, the moderate sample size. Moderate some size sometimes if you're not aware, if not a strong skew, or, or you know, you can use a T. But uh, right now, do we have more or less, you know, say, 10% no, it, outliers, it's okay, or 5% outliers? I don't, the, actually, if I say that, then 10 years down the road, <laughs> then more papers are going to be rejected <laughs> because um, you are going to be based on my statement today, okay? So maybe as, 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 uh, as a statistical community, um, perhaps, and I'm not the best to speak of it, or on behalf of it, is perhaps to educate our, our undergraduate students that, look, take the p-value and compare it with this alpha, 
Okay, so instead of pushing of what p-values actually is. So I don't want to give a prescription, look, if your outliers are so many out of these, then you should do A or otherwise do B. I do not want to do that. But what you can do and, um, and perhaps collaborate okay, as, as, as a nice community is give me the data and then the very first thing, if you gave me the data, I would actually plot the data. We, it seems to forget that visualization and one picture is better than 1,000 words or 1,000 different formulae. Okay, so I, what, what I would do is I would never give you a number, so many outliers do this, so many outliers do that. Okay, but maybe, maybe what is very important is actually to visualize the data. So basically, where you or do something else. So this means, this means uh, when I receive the, the, a data set, the first thing I will do just check, you know, visualize, can I see biological sense there? Correct. So if I make a biological sense, then I continue to apply a statistical tool That's to right. do like a normal normality, you know, test, That's all right. kind of tests, yeah, yeah. The, the, exactly. The data should inform the model. And at the same time, the model should be informative for the data. Basically say okay, it's a very like a collaborative approach. Basically okay. say, once I get the data here, I can I see, can I, you know, see any biologic sense, and then I make sure the data is not trash. I agree. Otherwise, if the data is trash, it does not make any sense. Exactly. And even good tool there, still trash out. Absolutely trash. right. Absolutely correct. Thank you. Yes. Has been used for uh, data where an outlier has been removed. For example, you said if you had uh, ten samples and one right. was a clear outlier, if you remove that one sample, can the t-test still be utilized? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I guess. I mean, <laughs> it's up to exactly. I mean, it's up to you. Is this outlier like? a freak of nature, like the pumpkin was like that small and then all of a sudden you got this Hercules pumpkin and then it's like freak of nature, then obviously you, it might be a rare event. So just throw it out of, out of your sample. Maybe think of it, maybe if you get another freak of nature pumpkin, I'm saying pumpkin because it was Halloween. Uh, so, um, so maybe keep it, you know, like just in mind that if you get the second one, maybe you should be worrying what's going on. Okay, if it was just one instance that you know, then sure, you can, you can remove it because everything else looks, looks the same, okay, looks normal. So I can go ahead with my test, okay. But if this happens recurrently, then an outlier may turn actually to an influential point instead, rather than just an outlier, okay. Can I continue? Yeah. Oh. Oh, I was, I was just going to say in response to your point, maybe not removing it, but you can test, you can see how much it influences your p-value. Mm. And if that's driving your conclusions and it's one point, then maybe reconsider. So one question I had uh, was, we've talked about skewedness. What about discrete distributions? So sometimes we have data that's not physiological measurements, but are instead rating systems, so the values can be zero through five, one, two, three. Right, I'll, I'll talk about that actually, because as of now I speak, I speak about, I talk about means, okay, and then means can be approached with a sample variant, a sample mean, I'm sorry, and then I move on to the z-statistic or the t-statistic, that exactly this is correct, you go by a continuous distribution. But that's not necessarily true. You may want to check proportions, for instance. Okay, if you go proportions and in under the sample, small sample size umbrella, then you do a binomial test in, in fact. Okay, I'll just talk about that just uh, briefly. I, I think this uh, discussion about the T statistic and, and the art involved, it's not just the mathematic, but it's also the art and, and your experience on, with data, and this particular type of data. This whole argument or discussion is why the p-value is so dangerous because what you do to avoid all that conversation is you just go with <coughs> this is the p-value I got and then you can get your paper published or you can get your manager to approve it but all this other stuff just confuses the situation and is that valid results or is that not valid results 
But if you just fall back on the p-value, everybody in the whole world agrees, even though the American Statistical Association is telling us, don't do that. You can't do everything on the p-value. So it's a, I think it's a very interesting conversation that we're having right now. All right. So I guess I'll continue. Uh, and I, as I promised, the, the last part of this talk is not going to be about p-values. It's going to be about alternatives. OK? So, so to, to return to this point with, with a skewness that raised all these uh, uh, questions is if you have a large sample size, and I understand that might not be the right community to say that here because you may not afford, you may can't afford like having large sample sizes, is you basically, you may want to transform your data, okay? If you have that in your mind, then, and then a logarithmic transformation would do it for you. So for instance, look at this right skewed norm uh, data. Then if you take the log transform, then everything lies perfectly on this across this uh, uh, red uh, line, and then you get uh, your normal distribution. OK, so if we go back to, 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 to the example one, OK, and then we could check if the data is normal, because according to my advice here, um, um, examine if your data are close to normal. OK, so this is a visualizer of that then you, s you can see they don't lie perfectly on the red line. Obviously not. I cannot have perfection. Okay? But they are pretty darn close. Okay? So I could say safely here that my data came from a, 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 t dis a, a standard normal distribution. So choosing the t statistic was a good practice in, in this example. Could you use uh, R squared in something like this as a, any kind of a valid uh way of determining if it's what but uh, okay what do you what are you trying to succeed with the r squared you see how much of a deviation is, it is from okay the so the, the the r measures the correlation the linear dependence right of the data okay if that's what you are after you could you could say that or but how you couldn't use that I'm, no, I'm not talking about regression here if that's what you are talking about, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about regression. This is basically the x and, the, okay, I, maybe I should have said that. What is on, on, on the x axis are the theoretical quantiles of the distribution, okay? And what is the, on the y axis is the, th the, the, the data, the quantiles coming from the data. So I'm examining my data with, against some theoretical distribution. OK? So if there is a perfect agreement, then everything would lie across this, this red line. OK? So basically, if these two distributions were exactly identical, then I would, I would see all the blue points on, on the red line. OK. So of course, as uh, it was asked before, you don't have to do uh, uh, tests just or inference just on means. You may want to examine standard deviations or proportions or parameters related to regression. Okay, so so the di so so the hypotheses are going to be different. However, what we are going to do, we are going to follow the very same strategy. Okay, so what only changes now is if the test statistic and its associate and its associated distribution. For instance, if you have a small sample size and then you want to test proportions then you have the, uh, you use the binomial distribution. And if you go to the large sample size, then you could use safely the normal distribution again. OK? So to answer your question, this is kind of like a discrete approach uh, uh, to the problem. OK, so summarizing now is the point of a test of significance is to provide a clear statement of the degree of evidence provided by the sample against the null hypothesis. So we wrote that the p-value is smaller than alpha. However, there is no sharp borderline between what's significant and what's not. Okay? So there is, a str in there is an increasingly strong evidence to reject the null hypothesis as the p-value decreases. And that's what's the correct statement here. Okay? So when the null hypothesis, which means no effect or no difference, can be rejected at the usual typical level 0.05, that means there is good evidence that an effect is present, and that effect actually could be small. You don't know that. Okay? And, 
and, and, and, and the, here is you want to design carefully your study. Okay? This is very important that your data is informative to, to, to you. Okay? And then definitely visualize uh, uh, your data. Okay? So for, I for instance, in many ancient cultures, they were saying in, uh, in China, actually, one picture is better than 1,000 words. Okay? So, and you are going to listen more about this on uh, 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 Dr. Wasserstein's talk uh, after mine. And the question is, to pee or not to pee? <laughs> okay? So do you really have to do a p-value? Do you have, does your approach need to be designed so that you state an null hypothesis versus an alternative? Okay? So, a basic, so perhaps you may want to do in a different framework. And a different framework is if you have a Bayesian approach, okay, to either hypothesis or a Bayesian approach altogether. So you can get your estimates be influenced by the data in some sense. So, you, okay? And then you're going to see another a Bayesian approach at uh, Dr. Contradi's uh, talk later. Okay? So a different, an even different approach, it might be you may want to do a statistical learning approach, a machine learning type of an approach, if you like. Okay? So for example, classification or clustering. You may want to, to spin the problem in a different way. Okay? So, and this is something that, that we are doing, I, I am doing in my, research, in my research lab and my graduate students and postdocs and things like that, and, and these guys. Okay? And I will be very happy to, to help you with. So, I don't want to, to get in too much in, in the learning approach, okay? But what I want to, to show you is just, is just an example, okay? So, for example, consider a set of data obtained from soybean plants, okay? And then, let's say that each soybean has exactly one disease, okay? That's the data that you collected. Now, the goal here is to understand, quote, quote, the characteristics of four different types of soybean diseases given features extracted from the plant so that when we are given a new soybean crop to be able to predict accurately what kind of disease it may have. Okay? So this is the problem. And what I'm going to consider, I'm going to consider 35 predictors. 35 reasons, okay? So based, and these predictors are going to be based on conditions and attributes of leaves, fruit pads, seeds, etc. But the data is going to be very small. I'm going to consider only 12 data points, okay? And three for each disease class, okay? For every disease, I will have three data, altogether 12, okay? And the data is not mine. I just went to this, uh, 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 the repository at uh, UC Irving, uh, and then you could actually download this data and, and play with, okay, on your own. And this is the Wikipedia pictures on soybean. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have this very small, tiny data set. Okay? And what I would like to do, I would like to maximize the amount of data we can use to build the model on due to small sample size. Because I have three, so I would like to maximize my information as much as possible. So one question is, can we use all of these data since they are just 12 to build the model? Okay? The answer is no. The answer is no because you would like to validate the model to ensure our accuracy results are not biased. Okay. So there is an option for you, and the option is you can leave one out, okay, cross-validation. What that means is you train the, your, your model on all but one data point and see how the model performs on the held out instance. Okay? And then, let's say since you have 12 data points, I'm going to build my model on 11, and I'm going to held out, hold out once, once it's going to be held out to validate, but I'm not going to do that once. I'm going to do that 12 times, so at least I give a chance to every single datum to be the one that I validate on, okay? 
And then I'm going to average out the error over all the instances. OK. So you could do that with something perhaps you've seen called logistic regression. OK. So what logistic regression will do is it will build a model. OK. It's like a regression. But now you take the, the log of the probability ratios, probability of disease 1 versus the probability uh, uh, of disease 2. And since it is a regression model, it's go this ratio is going to be linearly in the predictors. Okay? So, and of course, since like a regression, you are going to have some parameters, the slope and the intercept, if you like, that type, okay? that where you can, you can estimate them by some optimization methods. Maximum likelihood, for instance. Okay? And then you could test the significance of predictors using some significant tests, which is very similar to what we discussed earlier. And perhaps you could use your R squared to see how much of these data are basically linear, can be linearly interpreted with respect now to this log uh, odds ratio here. Okay? Now, so. If you never heard of logistic regression, this is fine. Just trust me. There is there. There is a black box, okay, that you can put on R or MATLAB or whatever, okay. And then, but you can put your data, type up that all I want to do is logistic regression. But by attacking to this problem with this learning approach that I told you, the leave one out cross validation, you will do the following: you are going to employ your logistic regression black box, if you like, on 11 points. And then you are going to evaluate its prediction you are going to, based on this 12th point that you, you held out. Okay? And then you are going to measure the error, the error or accuracy by basically answering the question, did I get it right? Okay? If I built my regression model, okay, and then based on the 12th point that I, I, I got, I predicted, did I predict that it has the right disease? Okay? And then you repeat 12 times, so all points get held out once. If you do that, you're getting an accuracy of 91.67%. Okay? And 91.67% means that 11 out of the 12 times, I got it right. I predicted that the 12th point that I held out, okay, it, is, it, it is, belongs to the right disease class. Okay, but the logistic regression still has this, like, uh, the, still has this framework of hypothesis testing. Okay, so what you may want to do is you may want to approach, a, you may want to have a totally different approach that does not involve any p-values, any sort of like regression or things like that that they may be associated with a hypothesis test. So such an easy and very intuitive is the decision tree. Okay? So the decision tree are recursive partitioning algorithms that come up with tree-like st structures. Okay? And these structures represent patterns in an underlying data set. So the way to, to build your tree is the following way. You start asking questions. So it says here, um, the computer is very clear. Uh, is the stem normal or abnormal? Okay? If you say, let's say, yes, then you go down here and then you ask the next question. Are the seeds discolored? Okay? Or if you say no, then you could, you could claim something like, is the fruit pad appearance? How about the fruit pad appearance? And then you continue with more splits on the predictors, these 35 predictor, predictors that I had. Okay? Until you reach something at the very bottom, which hopefully is going to classify you if it is disease 1 versus disease 2, disease 3, or disease 4. Okay? Now, this, this guy here, it is called the root node. So I, I really believe that this community should use the decision trees because <laughs> the terminology it is very much related to what you guys are doing. Okay? And then the, the others are called the branches. Okay? And then the terminal nodes, we call them the leaf nodes. Okay? Now, okay. So you are going to question, okay, so how do, you, how do I split? How do I ask the questions correctly? Okay? And how many of these splits do I need to get? Okay? So there are three, three criteria which I list here. 
The first, with respect to splitting decision, is the strategy to minimize the impurity at the leaves level. So what that means is when you split all the way down, you would like to have classes okay, whose members kind of have the similar features. Okay? So with this ret retro here, it's like I say minimal impurity, it means that maybe my class at the my one of my classes have four blue circles and the other one has red uh, 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 circles okay this it means it is it is very pure it's either uh, let's say uh, republican republic democrats or republicans okay <laughs> so Maximal impurity is if you cannot tell. So how you would classify this, this cluster, the, this, this disease class here? Blue or red? You can't tell because it is 50-50. So what I would like to do at the very bottom is to kind of have very pure classes. So the, the next criterion is when you stop, okay? As you can imagine, here, which is maximal impurity, I can ask one more question, and then everything will be split it perfectly. Okay? Two, two red, two blue. But that might not be a good idea, because if you have classes okay, with very few members in it, then you overfit your data, basically. Okay? You lead your data in such perfect distinction that when I give you one more, actually may not fit in any of these guys. Okay, too much tailoring on, 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 on the data. So this is what we say we should avoid overfitting. And then how do, you, how do you decide which type of class is? So here it is very clear that it is blue and this is red. Okay? But, um, um, but if you have, for instance, three blue and one red, then by majority vote, okay, the decision tree is very democratic, okay, then... Uh, um, then you say it is blue and vice versa, okay? So you have to look at the majority vote as we say in this. So anyway, if you do that, okay, if you, that yet? So if you do that, then we built a tree using 11 data, okay, to create the most pure nodes at each step, and leaf nodes are labeled according to the majority class, okay? And then I test it on the 12th example. If you do that, this, the accuracy drops down to 75%. And then it means nine out of 12 times I got this right, okay? So the question is like, that's a bummer. What did I tell you all that, okay? So can we do better? Yes, you can. How you can? You can actually make what we call random forests. You are not based your decision on just one tree, but you put lots of trees together in a certain way, and then you create the so-called random forest. So how you do this? There is, there is this little bullet here that says, at each split within each tree, you use a random subset of predictors instead of all of them. Okay? Instead of all 35, uniformly you pick, okay, with equal probability, you just pick a few, and then you, you create a tree. And then you, de you do K trees here, m multiple trees, 100 trees. Okay? And then you predict a new example, which is the soybean, by taking the majority class prediction out of all these 100 different, uh, different trees. So if I do that, then my accuracy, it is 100%. So I predicted accurately all types of diseases for all soybeans. Okay? So right here, I need to be very careful, and I should tell you, a random forest is not going to be perfect or the best model in every single case, okay? This 100% is just tailored for this data that I had, okay? So I cannot say that the logistic regression is not a good method because random forest is 100% uh, accurate. No, you may get data where the logistic regression is the right approach versus the random forest. You may want to play or uh, you may want to employ uh, all these different techniques to see what kind of accuracy you are getting, okay? So, but the, the take-home message is, uh, uh, from my research uh, uh, lab that I direct, 
is that the statistical learning method sometimes may be more appropriate than the typical traditional techniques, if you like. Okay? So, and when dealing with a small data set, statistical learning techniques such as leave one out cross validation allow training on a large portion of the data set while giving a good estimate for the true error. Concluding today, uh, we looked and dived into hypothesis testing, bolts and nuts. Okay, so the message is that we should use uh, with caution hypothesis testing, especially when small sample size. So look out for outliers and skewness. Make sure that your data, especially in the small scale, follow a normal distribution. Once again, nothing is wrong with the p-value. However, we do need to take it for what it is, which is a probability such that the smaller it is, the stronger the evidence against the null hypothesis. Okay? And then we got exposed to one alternative uh, via uh, uh, statistical learning and actually classification problem. That's it. Thank you very much. All right. It looks like we have some questions. Not so friendly faces anymore. <laughs> Actually not a question, but two comments. Uh, talk about alpha level. You have to remember it is, uh, it's known as a type 1 error rate. Mm -hmm. In other words, your willingness to be wrong. And so when you say 5, it's 5 out of 100 times. That is uh, traditional for agriculture. We convict on, those, uh, those, uh, on that evidence 24-7. Uh, now ask yourself, if you were a defendant in a capital murder trial, would you be willing to accept uh, the fact that the jury could be wrong five out of a hundred times and because your fanny is on the line, you might get fried? Uh, I don't think not. And uh, that has to do with, with our legal system. It's based on the assumption of uh, beyond reasonable doubt. However, justice is a human endeavor, so that's where we run into problems. But just keep, keep that in mind, and the, the type 1 error rate depends on the field. If you're dealing with regulatory agencies, uh, for example, a uh, negative effect of a new drug, uh, that won't cut it. So d just keep that in mind. The other thing is, just reminded me about fit, overfitting models. The, per, the analogy is buying a suit or a dress off a rack or having a custom-made dress or suit. The custom-made clothing will fit you, only you perfectly, and maybe only at this particular time. But it has absolutely no predictive <laughs> value. Sorry about that. I, I didn't want to imply anything. I, I can talk about myself. Right. Uh, but just keep that. In, but if you keep that analogy in mind, it will prevent you from overfitting a model. Because what you want is you want predictability. You want the ability to take a new sample that's not related at all to what you have, and you want to be whatever method you choose. You want to be able to classify that uh, that sample. Thank you. So this. Um Statistical learning technique is, is new to me, and I think okay. it's very exciting, and I think it's a, it's a neat alternative to traditional statistics. I'm glad you like that. A um, couple quick questions. Sure. When you have a de decision tree and you're making a forest, do the parameters for those decision trees have to be exclusive of other decision trees for this to be effective? I don't think I follow your question. Could you so, please repeat it? Uh, so if you're looking, at, rephrase. you're looking at color of the leaves, stems, and let, pots, let me go back. Let me in go one back. decision tree, do you have to be looking at sugar content, say, in other structures? Do the decision trees have to be mutually exclusive? No, no, in no, no. The parameters. The, 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 this is this is this is the important here, that I use for every tree, I use a random subset of predictors instead of all of them. So. Tree one, let's say I'm going to pick 20 out of these 35 predictors. And I'm going to do the splitting based on these 20. Okay. When I move to tree two, that doesn't mean I'll take these 20 out. Again, everything is my game. And then randomly I, put, I, I pick another 20 out of these 35, okay. and so on and so forth, right? So you use the same parameters. Sure. The same everything parameters. Back, in, uh, back in the bag, like it's a, a replacement kind you of sampling. Just you shuffle them up and that's right. them differently. Okay. 
Everything, every single time I have a uniform distribution, okay, so let's say if it is 35, every single predi predictor has probability one out of 35 to get picked with an H3. Excellent. This okay. is very exciting. Thank All you. Right. I think this is kind of a related question. As someone very unfamiliar with um, these learning trees, I, I'm interested to know what sort of world of pain I would be getting myself into to, to start deploying these, these techniques. And it, it, is there a lot of understanding required to um, prevent yourself from making horrendous errors, or are these kind of intuitive? No, uh, this is techniques? one technique, OK? This is one technique that we can use, we can deploy and see what it gives us out. As I said, I started with something very simplistic, okay, which is the decision tree, but it did not give me a good accuracy. But in statistics, we never give up. We move on to the next method, okay? So, so I create a forest, okay, because one decision tree was not a good approach. So I if, if the decision tree, if, sorry, the random forest may not give me the good result, there are, there are other types of, yeah. o o of techniques to, to deploy. No, I, I get that. And it's, okay. It seems very um, intuitive and. That's right. And that's why I used it. This that's level. why I'm I wondering use it. behind this what sort of level of complexity is involved for someone who has no familiarity with it to right. become familiar with this. Would you consider it difficult, easy? <laughs> <laughs> you asked the wrong person for that. <laughs> but. Generally, you think it's easy. For, for, no, no, no. Okay, listen. Uh, so. Here, for instance, I, 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 I drew these circles, okay, and I joke with the colors, uh, one or the other political party, since in a few days we have like elections. But behind, you don't go like this. There are information theoretic indices behind to decide. You try to mix it, minimize the entropy uh, or maximize the entropy, whatever, uh, um, or the en minimize the energy, maximize the entropy uh, behind that. Uh, or, uh, so there are some indices. Okay, there is the so-called the famous Gini index. Okay, what that is. So, so, so there is lots of math behind it. If you want to do it like black box, you could, I suppose. Okay, but maybe another thing. You get into p-value, you just plug in your data and then say, "Haha, smaller than alpha." Okay, <laughs> all right. Now I got it right. So you may get in trouble exactly the very same way. So. Uh, so that's why I strongly believe, uh, since it's like a society of collaboration nowadays, right? I mean, it, it's good to get on board with statisticians or uh, um, to, so, so to tell you the, the, if the results are, are, are right or wrong, or, or your approach is correct or not. Uh, we're, we're going to have to uh, stop. We're going to go into a networking break right now. And it'll be a great time to come up and ask uh, Vesalius directly your questions. We've used uh, decision trees uh, to, to good effect uh, at our company uh, using very simple logic type trees and got uh, very uh, interesting results that we couldn't get through traditional methods. So it's definitely something worth looking into. Uh, uh, thank you. One We're more statement. Yeah. Since you are so interested, one of my graduate students is in the market. Okay. He got his PhD. In he's going to get his PhD in mathematics. Is he and here? he's. Uh, he's supposed to be here, but he has a, a dentist appointment, so I forgive him. <laughs> uh, so, he, but he will be later also. So, if you want, his name is Andrew, and last name Marquese. Okay.